All right, let's dig into something that's probably on a lot of minds. Winter 2025, 2026. Mm -hmm. I mean, beyond just a simple guess, what's really uh, what's really in store for us. Our mission today is kind of cut through some pretty dense climate analysis, you know, uncovered the surprising bits about what this winter might actually feel like. Yeah. And what's really interesting, I think, is that the forecast isn't pointing towards like a uniformly cold winter across the board. Instead, we're looking at uh, significant atmospheric variability, think high impact, really severe cold air outbreaks, especially for North America and parts of Europe. It's shaping up to be a season of, well, high amplitude swings is a good way to put it. High amplitude swings. Yeah. Okay. So volatility, big ups and downs, not just steady cold. What's actually driving that? What are the, uh, the main culprits behind that kind of pattern? Exactly. Volatility. Well, there seem to be two main foundational drivers emerging. First, the development of a weak La Nina. And second, uh, a forecast weakening of the stratospheric polar vortex, the SPV. Okay, La Nina. Weak La Nina. That usually means cooler waters in the Pacific, right? Yeah. But you stressed weak. How much um, does a weak one actually have? Can other things easily push it aside? That's a great point. So yes, La Nina means cooler equatorial Pacific waters, and that does tend to strengthen a big atmospheric circulation pattern, the walker circulation. But like you said, the weak aspect is crucial here. It's uh, it's a subtler push, less yeah. consistent. And yeah, other patterns can overshadow it. Sometimes weak La Ninas have even meant, say, less snow than average in places like the mid-Atlantic, so it's not always straightforward cold. Right, okay. So La Nina is one piece, maybe a bit wobbly, but the stratospheric polar vortex, mm -hmm. That sounds much more dramatic. How does that fit into these wild swings you mentioned? Ugh, the SPV. It sounds dramatic, and it kind of is. It's basically this huge pool of super cold air way, way up in the stratosphere, miles above us. It's different from the jet stream that's lower down, giving us our daily weather. But here's the link. Sometimes big atmospheric waves push upwards and break into the stratosphere, disrupting that SPV. Think of it like waves breaking on a beach, but high in the atmosphere. This can cause what we call sudden stratospheric warmings, or SSWs. And when the SPV gets disrupted or weakens, it tends to force the jet stream below it to become much wavier, much more buckled, and that allows that frigid Arctic air, normally contained up high, to spill southwards, like opening the freezer door on the Arctic. Wow, okay, so disruption way up there yeah. directly impacts our weather down here. Yeah. And you're saying these things are linked. The weak La Nina and something else are sort of ganging up on the SPV. Exactly. That interaction is critical. The weak La Nina plus another pattern, the easterly phase of the quasi-biennial oscillation or QBOE, which by the way, we have pretty high forecast confidence in seeing this winter. These two factors together strongly increase the chances of a weaker, more disrupted SPV. And therefore, they significantly raise the odds of those SSW events happening, the ones that let the cold air out. Okay, so La Nina plus QBOE points towards a shaky SPV, which means higher risk of cold outbreaks. Got it. So what does the battlefield look like then? Where do these forces clash? Well, it sets up this real battleground scenario, especially over North America. There's a forecast for a negative Pacific North American pattern, the PNA. That often means cooler in the West US, warm in the East, but that pattern will be fighting against the potential for a widespread cold spilling down from the Arctic due to that disrupted SDV. So clash equals volatility. And they're always wild cards, right? Things that can nudge it one way or the other. Oh, absolutely. You've got the North Atlantic Oscillation, the mm -hmm. NAO. That's notoriously tricky to predict far in advance. It basically acts like a gatekeeper determining if the Arctic cold actually floods into the eastern US and Europe or if it stays bottled up or goes elsewhere. And then there's the Madden-Julian Oscillation, the MJO. Think of it as a pulse of weather moving around the tropics. The MJO, especially certain phases of it, will likely be key for the timing exactly when these severe cold outbreaks might hit during the winter. Okay, this is fascinating, but let's bring it home. What does this complex picture mean for you listening right now? What are the real world impacts? Right, the bottom line, well, for the energy sector. Expect potential for uh, pretty extreme volatility in heating demand. You can see price spikes when those cold shots hit hard. For agriculture, there's a bit of a double-edged sword. An increased risk of drought in the southern U.S., which fits some La Nina patterns, but also a real non-trivial risk of damaging freezes getting surprisingly far south. Think Texas, maybe even parts of Florida. Despite the overall seasonal forecast perhaps leaning warm, those SPV outbreaks can be brutal. And for mm -hmm. anyone involved in logistics, transportation, yeah, anticipate significant disruptions. Severe winter storms across the northern U.S., Canada, especially the prairies for deep cold, eastern Canada for storms, and likely parts of Europe, too. 
It really shows how interconnected everything is. Things happening miles up or oceans away can really hit home. And while you said the QBOE part is fairly certain, the timing of those big cold snaps, thanks to NAO and MJO, that's still very much up in the air. You mentioned an analog year. Yeah, for context, look back at the winter of 1995-1996. That was also a weak La Nina winter. And it featured a significantly disrupted polar vortex. The result was widespread, severe cold across the eastern US and parts of Europe. It's not a perfect match, of course, but it gives a flavor of what can happen. Okay, wrapping up then, any final thought for people to chew on? I guess if you connect all these dots, yeah. it just underscores how these subtle shifts, you know, ocean temperatures changing slightly, winds shifting way up in the stratosphere, how they can profoundly shape our daily lives, our heating bills, our travel, even the food on our plates. And maybe the bigger question it raises is, in our changing climate, how prepared are we really for these kinds of interconnected high amplitude swings? Food for thought.